This uh, story from the life of a woman named Corrie Ten Boom, as told by Corrie, is a story I've used in the past. So if it's familiar to you, I apologize, but it has a lot to say to us today. The words of Corrie Ten Boom. It was in a church in Munich that I saw him. A balding, heavyset man in a gray overcoat, a brown felt hat clutched between his hands. People were filing out of the basement room where I had just spoken, moving along the rows of wooden chairs to the door at the rear. It was 1947, and I had come from Holland to defeat Germany with the message that God forgives. It was the truth they needed most to hear in that bitter, bombed-out land just a couple of years after the defeat of their army in World War II. And she says, I gave them my favorite mental picture. Maybe because the sea is never far from a Hollander's mind, I like to think that that's where forgiven sins are thrown. When we confess our sins, I said, God cast them into the deepest ocean, gone forever. The solemn faces stared back at me, not quite daring to believe. There were never questions after a talk in Germany in 1947. People stood up in silence and in silence collected their wraps and in silence left the room. And that's when I saw him, working his way forward against the others. One moment I saw the overcoat and the brown hat. The next, a blue uniform and a visored cap with its skull and crossbones. It came back with a rush. The huge room with its harsh overhead lights. The pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor. The shame of walking naked past this man. I could see my sister's frail form ahead of me. Ribs sharp beneath the parchment skin. Betsy, how thin you were. Betsy and I had been arrested for concealing Jews in our home during the Nazi occupation of Holland. And this man had been a guard at Ravensbrück, the concentration camp where we were sent. Now he was in front of me, hand thrust out. A fine message, Fraulein. How good it is to know that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And I, who had spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my pocketbook rather than take that hand. He would not remember me, of course. How could he? How could he remember one prisoner among those thousands of women? But I remembered him. I remembered the leather crop swinging from his belt. I was face to face with one of my captors, and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, he was saying. I was a guard there. No, he did not remember me. But since that time, he went on, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear it from your lips as well. Fraulein, again, the, word, the hand came out. Will you forgive me? What would you do if you were Corey? What would I do? Our primary text today is one that you probably have not read before unless you're uh, someone who reads through the Bible in a year on occasion. That's the, about the only reason people would seem to have to go to this text from the Old Testament in 2 Samuel. Because for most of us, our experience with the Old Testament historical books goes about as far as the story our youth pastor, David Podsed, preached from last week, the story of David and Goliath. That's about what we know. And there's some other kings in there, but we're not sure who they are. And if we try to pronounce their names, our dentures fall out. And so we don't go there in Scripture. We pay little attention, if any, to the Old Testament books of Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles. But you should know that the books of First and Second Samuel together are a beautiful literary masterpiece. 
They begin with the miraculous birth of the prophet and political advisor Samuel to a mother who had not been able to have children. And the books of Samuel chronicle Israel's transition from a loose confederation of tribal states to a nation under the rule of a single central monarchy. And woven masterfully through this story of the early history of Israel, behind Israel's military entanglements with bordering nations, behind the political intrigue and power-seeking in King David's court, is the truth that God is at work behind the scenes, behind the plans of men seeking power, behind the military exploits of David and his military, behind David's successes and his failures. God was at work guiding and protecting and saving his people. We're going to see that today. Another theme running through this text is David's failure with Bathsheba. One of the things I love about Samuel is it doesn't cover anything up. It tells the whole story. The successes and the failures. And so we read about David's failure with Bathsheba, a woman who was not his wife. In fact, she was the wife of Uriah, a soldier in Israel's army. And while Uriah was away fighting for Israel, David saw Bathsheba, wanted her, had her brought to him, slept with her, and got her pregnant. And then, in an attempt to cover up his sin, he had her husband Uriah killed on the battlefield. Now, with the skill of a masterful artist, the writer of Samuel, near the end of his book, gives a listing of David's mighty men. He does this so that future generations will know that this wasn't just about David, that he had help, and that perhaps their own ancestors had played a role, a key role even, as instruments in the hand of God building the nation of Israel. And the writer ends his listing of the mighty men with these words. And there was Uriah, the Hittite. No other words about Uriah are mentioned. But we know, if we've read the story, who he is. The writer isn't trying to cover up David's failure. If he were going to do that, he'd have left the story out altogether. Instead, he allows these three chilling words, Uriah the Hittite, to haunt us. Prior to these words, we have no indication of the role Uriah played in Israel's army. Was he a foot soldier, a common grunt? No. He was one of David's best soldiers. One of David's mighty men, as Scripture calls them. There were 37 of them in total. Out of all the thousands in the army of Israel, 37 were singled out. He was a member of an elite group of fighting men. His version, David's version of SEAL Team 6 or the Secret Service. He was one of David's best soldiers. A man who likely had acted as bodyguard for David on more than one occasion. David had betrayed one of his closest and best. A man who had fought valiantly for Israel and protected David with his life. But Uriah wasn't the only one who David betrayed when he took Bathsheba to be his own. Another one of his mighty men was a man named Eliam, the son of Ahithophel. Eliam appears in the story of David and Bathsheba too. Look at 2 Samuel 11:3. David had caught sight of Bathsheba privately bathing, indicating that her house and the house of Uriah was very close to the palace itself. And he inquired about her, and he was told, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? 
Not only was Bathsheba the wife of one of David's strongest and best, she was the daughter of another one. And she was the granddaughter of Ahithophel, Eliam's father. Ahithophel, David's wisest and most trusted military advisor. In fact, people in the royal palace and in military leadership said that when Ahithophel spoke, it was as if he had consulted the word of the Lord. And so Ahithophel had every reason to be bitter with David. The husband of his granddaughter was dead. His granddaughter herself, now a part of David's growing harem, and his son was dealing with the betrayal of his son-in-law and comrade-at-arms, a man he had fought alongside. Ahithophel, David's closest advisor, had every reason to be bitter to be angry, to be consumed with hatred. So when one of David's sons, Absalom, fearing that David would one day pass the kingdom on to his younger brother, Bathsheba's son Solomon, instead of to him, when Absalom rebelled against his father and tried to take the kingdom by force, Ahithophel, David's best friend, joined him. Let's pick up the story in 2 Samuel 16, 20, as Absalom, with Ahithophel at his side, enters Jerusalem, and David flees. Then Absalom said to Ahithophel, give your counsel, what shall we do? And Ahithophel said to Absalom, go into your father's concubines, whom he has left to keep the house, and all Israel will hear that you have made yourself a stench to your father, and the hands of all who are with you will be strengthened. In other words, this will be the point of no return. Go take your father's wives for yourself in front of everyone, and those who are fighting with you will be encouraged. They will know you are all in. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof, and Absalom went into his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. Now in those days, the counsel that Ahithophel gave was as if one consulted the word of God. So was all the counsel of Ahithophel esteemed both by David and by Absalom. Now in typical Ahithophel fashion, this is shrewd and wide as advice if you're Absalom. He knows how to manipulate public power. He knows that if Absalom does this in the, in the light of day in front of everyone living in Jerusalem, he is openly defying his fleeing father and burning every bridge between the two of them. He knows that this will convince the hearts and minds of the people that Absalom is in charge now, and it will force Absalom and his men to act with shrewd cunning and fight with desperation, for now there is no going back. It's death or victory. And Ahithophel knows well the cunning and military prowess of David. He knows that Absalom is in for a real fight if things don't go perfectly for Absalom. So following Ahithophel's advice and openly breaking with his father forces Absalom into an all-or-nothing mentality. He can't go back. Absalom and Ahithophel have just burned every bridge. That's what happens when bitterness and hatred settle in our hearts. We begin to burn bridges. In his book, Finishing Strong, Steve Farrar sums up well the terrible price of this kind of sin. He says, it will take you farther than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay and cost you more than you're willing to pay, bitterness will. In his anger and with bitterness in his heart, Ahithophel has gone beyond the point of no return. He cannot turn back. His relationship with David cannot be restored. His advice is on record and has been followed. Bitterness, if allowed to run unchecked, can have a permanent impact on our lives. What Ahithophel doesn't understand is that God is even now behind the scenes dealing with David for his own sin with Bathsheba, 
You see, when the prophet Nathan had confronted David about Bathsheba and David repented, David still learned a hard lesson about the consequences of sin in, in, in this life. Yes, when we repent, we are forgiven by God in Christ, but that does not mean that our sin no longer has consequences. I've seen many men have affairs and repent in tears. Are they forgiven? Of course they are. Christ died for that sin. But can the marriage be saved? Sometimes. And sometimes not. The unfaithful spouse must live with the consequences of a poor decision, even though he or she is forgiven. And it's then the job of the church to come alongside that person and help them restore their life, provide comfort, never condemn them. But the price was paid by Christ, and the person has experienced the loss of a relationship in this life and may have to continue to struggle to maintain relationships with his children. Our job isn't to punch people when they're down. Our job is to lift people up, and David has to learn this lesson too. That sin does have consequences, even though we're forgiven. And through Nathan, God had told him, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. That's Absalom. And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun, for you did it secretly. But I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. Remember that theme in Samuel? God at work, even behind the scenes. He was even then at work dealing with David, whom he had forgiven. David would pay a heavy price in his life for his sin with Bathsheba. God was bringing about his work in David's life. But Ahithophel couldn't see that. He wouldn't see that. He wanted David to suffer more than he already was. It was becoming personal. Look at verse 1 of chapter 17. Moreover, Ahithophel said to Absalom, Let me choose 12,000 men, and I will arise and pursue David tonight. I will come upon him while he was weary and discouraged and throw him into a panic, and all the people who are with him will flee, and I will strike down only the king, and I will bring all the people back to you as a bride comes home to her husband. You seek the life of only one man, and all the people will be at peace. And the advice seemed right in the eyes of Absalom and all the elders of Israel. Again, from Absalom's perspective, this is really good advice. David and those still faithful to him had fled in haste. They were exhausted, and they were at this time backed up against the Jordan River. There was no way they could manage a safe river crossing while still trying to fight off an immediate attack by Absalom's men. And so Ahithophel says, go after them now, but let me lead it. When Israel asked for a king, they asked for a king who would lead them into battle. And that's what David did. He led the armies of Israel into battle. Most of the time, not all of the time. No, no ancient king did. But most of the time. But Ahithophel says, don't do that, Absalom. Let me go. David's mine. I want him. Fortunately for David, God was at work. You see, Absalom had another advisor who happened to be a spy sent by David. See the intrigue? The messiness? Reads like a novel. You should read Samuel. It's good reading. It's PG-13. <laughs> but it's good reading. It is PG-13. Don't over-spiritualize Samuel tells the truth. This is real life. And real life gets messy. 
So David had sent this advisor to be a spy to thwart Ahithophel's advice because David knew darn well, if Absalom listens to this guy, I'm in trouble because he's won a lot of battles for me by telling me what to do. And the second part of Ahithophel's plan was not followed. He wanted to strike while the iron was hot. To finish David off immediately while he was disorganized and exhausted, but Absalom listened to David's spy and decided to wait. But look at this. Look at what Ahithophel said. Let me choose 12,000 men, and I will arise and pursue David tonight. I will strike down the king. He said, David is mine. Now it's personal. He wants to personally destroy David, to kill him himself. He wants David's life to be snuffed out like David had snuffed out the life of his granddaughter's husband, Uriah. But again, Ahithophel had no idea that God was at work behind the scenes. Samuel lets us know. Look at verse 14. And Absalom and all the men of Israel said, The council of Hushai the archite, that was David's spy, is better than the counsel of Ahithophel. For the Lord had ordained to defeat the good counsel of Ahithophel so that the Lord might bring harm upon Absalom. Remember, Absalom is David's son. He's paying a heavy price, even though he is forgiven. And this is the pivotal point of the entire text. The writer of Samuel peels back the curtains and reveals God's hand at work in this mess, protecting David's life and honoring his covenant with David, his promise with David, even though David had sinned. And God was punishing those who sought of their own free will to seek and destroy David. At the same time, God was able to use this episode to remind him, sin does have its consequences. Your house is a mess, David, because of what you've done, God was in a sense saying, but I love you and I am faithful to my covenant and I will protect you, but your life is now forever changed. You will have to live with the consequences of your actions. And if it the, it hit the fell, see, you can't always say these words right. <laughs> spit all over your Bible and has no idea that God is fully capable of dealing with David's injustice and sin without him. And so he tries to take matters into his own hands. And honestly, because God himself said it was good counsel, <laughs> if God had permitted Ahithophel to do what he wanted, it is likely that David would have died in the attack. But God was dealing with David. So Ahithophel didn't need to get involved. But he did. Hearts full of bitterness and hatred refused to allow God to be God, the creator, sustainer, and redeemer, and judge over all the earth. They try to take matters into their own hands. Now, this isn't to say that if real wrong has been done, if laws have been broken or people have been criminally negligent, that we shouldn't allow law enforcement and the judicial system to do its job. That's fine. That's one way people realize that actions have consequences. But it's not our role to take matters into our own hands, to allow bitterness and hatred to well up in our hearts when we have been wronged or someone close to us has been wronged. God can fully handle what needs to happen. And he often brings about his justice, as Samuel reminds us, by working behind the scenes. You see, God had already pronounced judgment on David through the prophet Nathan. And Ahithophel, David's closest and most trusted advisor, would have heard about it. May have even been there when Nathan spoke to him. You see, in Psalm 6, 55, the psalm from which we pulled the call to worship this morning, David is writing about this time in his life. And he says in another place in that psalm, For it is not an enemy who taunts me. Then I could bear it. 
It is not an adversary who deals insolently with me. Then I could hide from him. It's you, my equal. David considered him an equal to him as king. My companion, my familiar friend, We used to take sweet counsel together. Within God's house, we walked among the throng together. He was always at David's side. You ever feel that way? I thought I knew you. I guess I didn't. You ever had someone let you down that way? Yes, Ahithophel and his family were legitimately wronged by David. And good old David had it recorded for all future generations to read the gory details of. Not just his own people. Us, too. But instead of turning justice over to God's working, which was already being meted out, Ahithophel decided to join in the action. To become an advisor to Absalom, and he allowed bitterness and hatred to run unchecked in his heart, allowing it to overflow to the point where he himself was willing to lead the strike on David and deal with David personally. Pastor Craig Groeschel, who is the whose church is the creator of the Bible app, Life Church, that we all use. If you Google apps on your phone and download the one that just says Bible. It's his church that made it. He talks about his own journey with anger and bitterness, and he says this. My biggest struggle with bitterness started when my family discovered the awful truth about someone we had trusted in a position of authority over my little sister. Most kids in our small town junior high took at least one class from a man named Max on their journey through the sixth grade. To many kids, Max was a favorite teacher, always cutting up, telling jokes, and handing out easy A's. To me, he became the object of the deepest bitterness I've ever known. Throughout the years, Max developed special relationships with his favorite students. Though none of us were aware of it at the time, we discovered years later that all his favorite students happened to be cute young girls. My little sister, whom I treasured and loved, became one of Max's victims. Now, some studies show that as many as one out of three girls and one in four boys suffer some sort of sexual abuse. Whatever the numbers, this tragedy must crush God's heart. I know it crushed mine as a brother. I remember trying to absorb the painful truth. How should I respond? Should we track him down, have him arrested, beat the life out of him? Make no mistake. I was furious the moment I heard about his abuse. But the more I thought about it, my anger blossomed into rage, and the seeds of bitterness planted in my heart grew to a full-blown briar patch of revenge. And I prayed that Max would suffer eternally in hell. And I vowed to make him suffer on earth before facing God's judgment. My plan for revenge wasn't necessary. To my bittersweet delight, we found that Max was suffering in a hospital fighting for his life against a crippling disease, muscular dystrophy. I remember thanking God for his justice and giving Max what he deserved. Most would agree that my bitterness toward Max was justifiable. But no matter how justifiable my feelings were, in God's eyes, my self-righteous hatred was just as sinful as Max's crime. Even writing that statement all these years later remains difficult. How could my desire for justice be considered as sinful as this monster's lustful actions? The vast majority of people would agree that my hate and judgmental rage were more than justified. In the course of time, however, I learned that bitterness never draws us closer to God. Bitterness is a non-productive, 
toxic emotion, usually resulting from resentment over unmet needs. I wanted Max to suffer. But I was punishing no one but myself and those around me who experienced the scalding spillovers of the acid churning inside of me. You see, bitterness impacts not just the person that we want justice from and for. It impacts us. And it impacts those we love. It's normal and fine to feel anger when you or someone you love has legitimately been wronged. Anger itself is not sinful. In fact, sometimes anger is righteous. It would be wrong not to feel angry in some situations. But as Ben read earlier today, Ephesians 4 says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. It's okay to be angry, but it's not okay to store it, to allow it to fester and burn. Because eventually it will consume you and spill over into words and actions that permanently burn bridges, that seek to take matters into our own hands, and ultimately actions that can destroy our relationships with others. Look at verse 23. When Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he saddled his donkey and went off home to his own city. He set his house in order and hanged himself, and he died and was buried in the tomb of his father. You know, it's interesting that St. Matthew, in writing about the betrayal of Judas, wrote it very similarly to this. He actually modeled his writing of the story of Judas' betrayal of Jesus after the model of Ahithophel's betrayal of David. If Ahithophel likely knew two things. First, if his advice, his advice was not followed, David was eventually going to win. For he was a shrewd military advisor. And second, he had gone too far. In siding with Absalom and allowing his anger and bitterness to well up into full-blown hatred, he had crossed the line and burned bridges. In his mind, he was a dead man anyway and would likely be executed by David when he triumphed. Although Scripture reminds us time and again in the Old Testament of David's ability ability at times to forgive those who had hurt and betrayed him. In his mind, he's failed. And his hatred consumes him to the point where he takes his own life. David's actions did not destroy Ahithophel. They destroyed David's own family, and they destroyed the life of Uriah, and David was paying the price for that even now. But they didn't destroy Ahithophel. What did? Bitterness and anger left unchecked, welling up inside him like a raging storm. One man tells this story. He says, my friend Steve warned me that he didn't believe in forgiveness. God could never forgive me, he said. Okay, maybe he could forgive 70% of my sins, but not all of them. When I tried to explain that when we trust Jesus, he forgives 100% of our sins, Steve interrupted, yeah, fine, but you don't know the stuff I've done. Then he told the following story. 19 years ago, this guy stole my wife away from me. They got married and moved to Florida while my life unraveled. After I was arrested for assaulting a police officer, this guy smirked through the entire court hearing. When I was convicted, he flipped me the finger. I've hated him for 19 years. He's coming up here next week. I have a 32 caliber pistol strapped around my ankle, and when I see him, I'll kill him. And then he chillingly concluded, I've thought all about it. I'm 63 years old. I'll get a life sentence but I'll also get free medical and dental and a warm bed and three meals a day. All of this bitterness and resentment feels so right. Forgiveness seems weird. Steve was right about one point. Forgiveness often feels like an unnatural act. So what should followers of Jesus tell Steve? Why forgive for something like that? 
After Steve told me this story, I paused for a long time before I finally managed to stammer, well, I guess it doesn't matter if you go to jail because you're already in jail. The guy who stole your wife and smirked at your hearing isn't in jail. You are. That guy's free. But you're a prisoner of your own hate, and you're slowly killing yourself. And unless you forgive, you'll remain trapped for the rest of your life. A week later, he called me and said, you know, I get your point. I put the gun away. I don't want to spend the rest of my life in jail or enslaved to my own hate. Will you pray for me that Jesus will release me? Forgiveness, like every other aspect of following Jesus, involves a long journey. As we consistently receive Jesus' forgiveness for our sins, it will soften our hearts toward those who have wounded us. And we've all been wounded, many of us recently. Then as we continue to trust and grow in Christ, slowly by God's grace, we'll find more freedom to forgive than we ever imagined. And so we come back to Corey Ten Boom with the arm of her captor, the man who had imprisoned her, beat her, watched her sister die, her parents die in that concentration camp, who made her parade before him naked, the arm of her captor outstretched, waiting for her to grasp it. Here's what she writes. And I stood there. I, whose sins had again and again needed to be forgiven, and I could not forgive. Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for the asking? It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out, to, but to me it seemed like hours. As I wrestled with the most difficult thing I ever had to do, for I had to do it. I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition that we forgive those who have injured us. One of the hard sayings of Jesus. If you don't forgive men their trespasses, Jesus says, neither will your Father in heaven forgive yours. In other words, you have been forgiven. Now be a person of forgiveness. I knew it not only as a commandment of God, but as a daily experience, she said. Since the end of the war, I had had a home in Holland for the victims of Nazi brutality. Those who were able to forgive their former enemies were able also to return to the outside world and rebuild their lives, no matter what the physical scars. Those who nurse their bitterness remain invalids. It was as simple and as horrible as that. And still... I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. Interesting that no amount of medical intervention made a difference between those who were able to return to life and those who were not. Mind and body are related. And those who could forgive could also get better. And still I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion, and I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will. And the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Help, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You're going to have to supply the feeling, God. All I can do is raise my hand. And so woodenly and mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one outstretched to me, and as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder and raced down my arm and sprang into our joined hands, and then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. <laughs> 
That is the power of the gospel. That is what Jesus Christ came to enable you and I to do as he has forgiven us. So now we can forgive those who have wronged us. Those against whom we harbor bitterness. And for some of us today, it's time to let it go. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you came that we might have life. Not to be imprisoned by our own anger, not to be imprisoned by the actions of others, but to be free in you regardless of our circumstances. So many of us have been wronged in one way or another. For some, it's been huge wrongs. For others, small ones that have built up over time. But we know anger itself isn't wrong. But allowing that anger to sit and fester, to not be dealt with, to begin to harbor bitterness and rage and hatred, that is wrong. So help us this morning, Lord, to let it go because of your son, Jesus, because this is Christ's church. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.